Look Home at Angel is undoubtedly the most acclaimed literary work by a native of North Carolina. And its fame has been undiminished for more than 50 years. In fact, Thomas Wolfe's literary reputation as an American writer has prompted special collections throughout the United States. I shall mention four of them. First, at the Pack Public Library in Asheville, the Wolf Collection is particularly strong on local materials, as it should be, because that's where Wolf was born. At the University Library in Chapel Hill, the strongest part of the collection has to do with the Wolf family papers. At Harvard University, where Wolf was a graduate student, the emphasis is upon the manuscripts of the writer himself. And here at St. Mary's College in Raleigh, we are in the Thomas Wolf Room, which was especially established to pre have pre present materials by and about Wolf that would appeal to the beginning college student instead of the graduate researcher. Now there are four main reasons for Wolf's literary acclaim. First is the narrative itself. It is direct and clear. It carries a boy from infancy until early manhood, from innocence to maturity. There are no deviations. The story runs right down a clear path. The second reason has to do with the language of the book. It is an attractive language. Once a writer was said about his friend Wolf that Wolf was drunk with words. His vocabulary was rich and vast. And I can remember on the first, the first time I read Look Home at Angel that it was the language which uh, appealed to me. The language is poetic. It is rhapsodic. It is somewhat different from the language and vocabulary of other writers of Wolf's time. A third point to remember in reading Look Home at Angel is that it has a subtitle, A Story of the Buried Life. And by the word buried, Wolf means the secret life. In other words, Look Home at Angel is a novel on two levels. First, the straight, realistic, forward-moving narrative that I've already mentioned. The second is the poetic symbolism of the novel, expressing the buried life of the subtitle. From the very first line in the poem, the familiar, a stone, a leaf, an unfound door, to the end of the poem where Wolf's refrain, O lost, and by the wind-grieved ghost, come back again. The novel is permeated with these poetic symbols, even unto the very last chapter where the marble angels in the square walk about at midnight in a fantastic moment of revelation. I think, however, that in spite of the three points I've mentioned, the greatest characteristic, the greatest attraction, the greatest appeal to Look Home at Angel is none of the three things I've mentioned, but its characters themselves, the members of Eugene Gant's family. First, there is W.O. Gant, the father. He's the far wanderer. He's lusty and uh, he's a comic. And then there's the mother, 
Eliza, unlike the far wanderer, she is of the earth. She is uh, thrifty, and she is psychic, and she is based on a woman of the North Carolina mountains. And the children, there is Helen with all of her frustrations, and then there's Luke, the go-getter, and then there's Ben, the outcast. All of these weaving in and out of the life of the protagonist, who of course is Eugene Gant, or if you will, Thomas Wolfe himself. Look Home at Angel was written out of a need for discovery. In 1926, Thomas Wolfe had discovered much about life but he realized that only through memory and writing could his knowledge be shaped into art. Four years later, with days and nights of words that raced across 17 ledgers and over a thousand pages, the manuscript of Look Home at Angel was completed. Look Homeward Angel was published in October 1929. It was Thomas Wolfe's first and most famous novel. It was a Beale's Dung Roman, that is an, an apprenticeship novel, a novel of a youth growing from boyhood into early manhood. It was also a roman à clay, which is a French word meaning that it was a novel in which one could identify the scenes and the people. The scenes and the people were of those whom Wolfe had known here in Asheville. And when the novel reached Asheville in October 1929, the book readers picked it up and were astounded to realize that they knew every spot that Wolf had mentioned in the book and knew the prototypes of every character in every one of its pages. It shocked the town. But really that isn't what Look Homeward Angel was all about. Look Homeward Angel was subtitled A Story of the Buried Life and by that Wolf meant that Underneath all these everyday scenes and characters, he was expressing the soul and the spirit of a sensitive youngster as he grew up. I am sitting here on the porch of the old Kentucky home, which was the boarding house of the mother of Thomas Wolfe. He, in the novel, he called it Dixieland. It is now a North Carolina historic site and is doubly famous because it is not only the scene of the boyhood of a major American novelist, it is also the scene of his major American novel. It is maintained today just as it was in the year 1916 and it is not pritted up. And it was in this house as a youngster that this very perceptive boy experienced the sounds and the sights and the tastes of a youngster who eventually turned it all into literary art. For Thomas Wolfe, imagination and writing became the door through which he could escape the shackles of Asheville, the shackles of his family, and the terrific pains of youth and growing up. As a child in this very house, he felt himself to be a stranger, an outsider, and in this hall, and in these rooms, Eugene would walk and hear 
the incessant clatter of Eliza's borders. Here in the dining room, the chairs were filled every summer by the boarders who were supplied with bounteous food. Oh, Eliza would come from the kitchen and she would, with her, uh, with her help, uh, her daughters and sometimes the boys and, and, and sometimes some of the black servants, and they would just fill the plates with all the vegetables and fruit that Eliza had been canning over the spring and uh, throughout the year. Oh, the squash who was passed around and the corn on the cob. Uh, Eliza felt that this was necessary because she had every intention of making money on the boarding house and if she canned and fed the boarders food which she had arranged for, of course, the price was much less than it, if it had been bought from a, a wholesaler. Eugene, her son, didn't much like this dining room. He felt that he didn't have a place in it. And because if he was sitting in a chair and a boarder came in, he was asked by his mother to get up and go away and so the boarder could be seated. And this sort of treatment, Eugene resented because it left him no home. I don't want to leave the impression that he was unfriendly with the boarders. He liked them. He liked to talk and he would uh, meet with them on the porch and in the hallways and, and, uh, and, and particularly the, the younger women and even some of the older ones he loved and was very friendly with. But even so, the borders remained a barrier between Eugene and the family that he so loved. From the restrictions and exposure of life in the boarding house, young Eugene sought escape in books. He would go to the public library, small though it was, and bring home as many books as was allowed and he would read away the afternoons and evenings in the world of his imagination. And he also had at his disposal his father's library. His father was not a well-educated man, but he loved books and he had attended the theater in Baltimore. And he, the, the great works of Shakespeare, he could recite by heart. And so he built up a home library and his youngest son read voluminously. There were such books as Omu, a Romance of the South Seas by Herman Melville, a real classic, and also such trivia as The Motorboat Boys on the St. Lawrence. But it made no difference to young Eugene. He read them all. Eugene's father, William Oliver Gann, was a stonecutter. He was a native of Pennsylvania, and after the Civil War, he went to Baltimore, where he apprenticed himself to a sculptor there. And he uh, learned to carve. Later on, in Reconstruction times, he moved into the South, first to Columbia, South Carolina, and then into Raleigh, where he prospered. And later on, he came to Asheville when his second wife, a tubercular, felt the need for a place where her health could be improved. Eugene always felt of his father as an artist in stone. And he tells in the novel, at the very beginning of it, how his father could carve the little lamb that would go over the grave of an infant, and how he could carve beautifully the folded hands in death. 
and the letters, the names, the dates on the tombstones, fine and clear. But there was one thing he could not do. He could not call the angel. He tried and he couldn't do it. And so eventually, this frustration of the complete artist, he uh, arranged by buying a stone angel from an agent in Baltimore. It was an angel which had been carved in Italy out of Carrara marble, and he put this stone angel on the porch of his shop. And there it reminded him of his frustrations as an artist. It was his ultimate frustration, as all of us are ultimately defeated when we search for perfection. Throughout Look Homeward Angel, Wolf recaptures the past. He remembers and feels the voices, the rooms, the music and light of his childhood. Eugene Gant was a sensitive youth and his conflict was one among himself, his world and his family. In Look Home at Angel, Wolf would describe the frustrations and resentments which Eugene felt toward his chaotic family. Wolf would remember his sister Mabel and especially his brother Ben with warmth. In the parlor, Mabel would play for the boarders and music would drip throughout the house. Here, at the top of the stairs in the boarding house, Eugene would stay from time to time. Mainly he would lie awake at night and that vivid memory of his, which he had inherited from his mother and for which nothing had ever been forgotten, would begin to try to recapture the past. He remembered everything. The sights of the mountains surrounding him, which rimmed in, in the sounds of the early morning milk carts as the horses struck the cobble streets, and the colors of the seasons, the autumn leaves, the green of spring and the glory of summer and the cold white of winter. And as he lay in this bed, he remembered them all and he would use them when he became an artist. Young Eugene dreamed of escape in this house, but it wasn't until the train carried him away from here to his college years in Pulpit Hill, that he would begin his freedom at last. By train, Eugene Gant traveled toward a new life in the university village called Pulpit Hill. In Look Home with Angel, Wolf remembered his undergraduate experience at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill as the golden years. He grew from a shy 15-year-old freshman into a self-assured college senior. After his early days of adjustment to university life, Wolf flourished. He joined everything, debate clubs, a social fraternity, literary clubs. He became editor of the Tar Heel campus newspaper. He was on the student council. By his senior year, he was one of the most popular students on the campus. And inside the young man from Asheville, as he dashed about campus, were the stirrings of a desire 
to write. In the fall of 1916, when Thomas Wolfe arrived in the village of Chapel Hill, the university was little more than a small provincial college. Surrounding the old well in the center of the campus were buildings ancient and poorly maintained. And yet, within those buildings were a number of outstanding professors under whom Wolf flourished like a palm tree in Arcadia. In Edwin Greenlaw's class, he fell in love with the English Romantic poets, and furthermore, he learned to write about them. For Frederick Koch, he composed folk plays, and then in there, decided on a career as a dramatist. Horace Williams' philosophy professor taught him how to think. At Chapel Hill, Wolfe received an excellent education. The train trip which Wolfe took in September 1920 from Asheville to Harvard takes up almost 90 pages in his second novel of Time and the River. His carefree days as a student in the provincial south were over and gone. Here was the big world, the greatest university in all America, with its old buildings underneath the trees of Harvard Yard. But to Wolf that September day, it seemed like a cold and icy Northland. But at first he was lonely and he was abashed and he was homesick, but not for long. He had a great job to do. He had to learn to write plays under Professor Baker first. And then he had to read every one of those millions of books in the Widener Library, which was the greatest library in a university campus in all the world. Wolf's graduate years were significant to his development as an artist. Today, the Houghton Library at Harvard University holds the largest collection of Wolf manuscripts and ledgers in the world, including the original manuscript of Look Homeward Angel. Professor Richard Kennedy of Temple University has produced several important works on Wolf and is considered a leader in Wolf scholarship. His research often brings him to the Wolf manuscript collection in the Houghton Library at Harvard. So when Wolf came here and began to uh, write and be in this atmosphere where there was real talk about uh, uh, the professional theater, he began to have some kind of sense of a literary destiny. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when his play, Welcome to Our City, was chosen uh, to be uh, uh, the one three-act play that, that was performed during that year of 1923, he felt uh, very proud and uh, sort of justified in all this money that his mother was spending to help him go to Harvard and so on. Uh, that play was also considered by the uh, Harvard Workshop people to be th the most unusual play that they'd ever had here. It was Wolf's first trip to Altamont, as he called Asheville, because he said it in his hometown, and here was this play about a race riot, uh, a play that had a lot of satire directed at contemporary American small-town life, uh, and it was a very exciting thing for him, and he felt that uh, Maybe that was the road to success now. Thomas Wolfe used to go to a, one of the rooms, a reading room in the, in the uh, Widener Library here, 
where uh, there was a general reading library of the classic works uh, of English and American literature and world literature. Well, he read enormously uh, as uh, he reflects in his Eugene Gant character in Of Time and the River. Uh, he, <clears throat> he says that uh, Eugene Gant tried to read all the books in the Harvard Library, which is, of course, uh, <clears throat> somewhat of an exaggeration. He used to sit in those great big leather chairs and, and read uh, by the hour. And he, he read very widely uh, from uh, the, the, the uh, works in translation from the early Greeks all the way up to uh, the contemporary drama. It was, this, this was a real contribution to uh, his uh, development. As a matter of fact, he, he, when he began to uh, uh, study uh, under John Livingston Lowe's, about Coleridge and how Coleridge's enormous reading uh, later surfaced in uh, the uh, uh, the Ancient Mariner and uh, in Kubla Khan. Uh, he he had this feeling: if I if I can only read myself full, I, some of this will uh, sink into the well of unconscious memory, as Professor Lowe's uh, called it, and uh, later then rise to the surface in uh, images to. Uh, uh, enrich what I write. And, and, and in a way, that happened. Wolf finished writing Look Home at Angel in 1928. Though his novel, then entitled Oh Lost, was only seen by Aline Bernstein and a few others, he clung to a hope that it would eventually be published. Maxwell Perkins would provide the support and direction he needed from an editor. As you know, uh, uh, Perkins was enormously uh, uh, important to Wolf, uh, both personally and uh, in his development of his career as a novelist. Uh, Wolf had this extremely long uh, typescript, which he called a lost, that had been around from one uh, publisher to another. And uh, publishers, readers would uh, wade through the first portion of it and then send it back to him. Uh, and, but at length, at Scribner's, uh, the members of the Scribner staff spent enough time with this manuscript so that uh, uh, they uh, were able to see that here was a very, very important work, though it was enormously long. So uh, what happened was that uh, Perkins got hold of Wolf and asked him to come uh, to the office and talk with him. He said that they were willing to publish this novel if uh, they could work out some way to uh, uh, reduce it to a, a publishable volume. Actually, the changes that uh, the cuts uh, that uh, Perkins uh, suggested were on a whole beneficial to to the book. There are some things in there that are uh, that are. Uh, well, it's really too bad to lose them, and one can understand why Wolf uh, was very sorry to see them go. Uh, for instance, uh, there's the uh, uh, sequence in there where young Eugene Gant goes to the public library and he reads all of these uh, boys' adventure stories, and uh, then he uh, is uh, uh, said by uh, the author to uh, uh, have these fantasies where he relives the life of some of these uh, the lives of some of these heroes. Now, there are uh, there were about five of these fantasies in uh, the book, and uh, Perkins cut it down to two. And of course, they're very effective. Uh, but for instance, uh, there's one of them. I've I've got the page open here in the manuscript to the one, uh, the fantasy about uh, uh, Eugene as. Uh, uh, Richard Devereaux, uh, who is uh, down fighting against the Mexicans, presumably during the Mexican War or something like that, and there's a, there is a Mexican captain who is saying to him things like, uh, Oh, do you dare, you Yankee pig? And he draws his sword from his uh, belt and strides furiously forward. The next moment, a hard brown fist, backed by 180 pounds of Yankee bone and sinew, landed solidly upon the point of the captain's jaw. The captain sat down abruptly, and, and so on it goes as the, as the hero. And, and, and in this wonderful parody of the style of these romantic uh, 
like uh, adventure stories. Professor David Herbert Donald, a Pulitzer Prize historian of Harvard University, did his work here for a biography of Thomas Wolfe. Now, it's that kind of incremental quality, the feeling that one is just a little more than anybody else that pours over into pretty much everything Wolfe did, said, and wrote. Much of life was simply very difficult for him for this reason. Everything was just a little too small for Wolf. Uh, he was a little too large for normal uh, purposes. The difficulties of finding shoes. He wore size 13 extra wide. And there are just not many stores that carry that kind of shoes. When he took the Pullman uh, car from New York to Asheville and back, the famous K-19, the births were never right. The problems of finding a bid uh, that fit him. Now, all of these matters mm, mm, were, in a sense, a kind of a metaphor for Wolf. Uh, it was not that mm, he was a giant and something abnormal, but they expressed, in a way, his sense that he had larger appetites, larger desires, and indeed a larger scope than normal uh, human beings. He wrote accordingly. And uh, one of his great problems uh, was simply mm, that he wrote a great deal, uh, very, very long uh, books, much longer than anybody else. Look, Home with Angel, the manuscript is 1,114 pages, which is a stack about yay high of tight pages. Now, that's more than three times the length of the average first novel of the 1920s. And no wonder he had trouble finding a, a publisher because it was an enormous risk, a huge investment to take on an absolutely unknown author with this kind of illimitable amount of uh, prose. The same kind of problem of gargantuanism uh, spread out over his processes of revision when he was finally accepted by Scribner's and they wanted him to edit the manuscript down and he did indeed try to abridge it. When he would try to take out by 10,000 words, he would do that, but replace them with 50,000 words so that it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and there was simply no way of keeping it within conventional framework. Consequently, everything about uh, our wolf's writing is oversized. The Homewood Angel has 90 named characters and must have dozens of others unnamed or uh, mentioned uh, only in passing. Uh, it is a tremendously long book, even in its abridged form as it was published. It's more than 600 uh, uh, pages. It covers Asheville, uh, it covers North Carolina, it covers indeed much of the whole South. So that there was a spread about Wolf that to some extent reflected this kind of oversized quality about the man. In size and spirit, Wolf felt different from everyone around him. When he took the memories of small town Asheville and turned them into the reality of his first novel, the portrait was not always flattering, for Wolf had Asheville in mind for his creation of Altamont in Look Homeward Angel. The city would never forget him. Perkins got worried, and Wolf got worried. So even before the book came out, uh, Wolf drafted a curious uh, letter that he was going to send to the editor of the Asheville, uh, what is it called, uh, Citizen, that um, was going to explain mm, that it was really all fictional and that he really was not libeling his city and so on. He didn't send it, but it's clear that mm, he anticipated there was going to be trouble. The book reached Asheville in uh, 1929, and copies began to circulate. And believe me, there was panic. 
all Asheville was buzzing about it because everybody was looking, is that me? Is that you? Is it true that your grandfather slept with my grandmother? Uh, is it true that so-and-so is the um, ill-begotten child of somebody else that uh, we hadn't thought of? Uh, is it true that so-and-so swindled somebody else out of this amount of money? They were in a, a panic. Many people began writing to Wolf. Uh, he himself was amusing uh, in a later book called You Can't Go Home Again, uh, writing about the letters that he received. There were people uh, who attacked him, uh, who said uh, that he was a viper, uh, that he was a snake, that it was unfortunate that he had ever been born, that if he ever came back, they would dra uh, drag his ugly carcass across Pack Square in Asheville. There were one or two people who wrote to say that they were terribly offended that he had left them out of the book. And there was at least one person who wrote to say, I wish you'd talked to me before writing this book. I knew a lot of real dirt that you could have put in that you didn't. Nevertheless, Asheville was very much upset. Wolf was a terribly sensitive man. Any criticism sent him into shock waves of depression, frequently heavy drinking, uh, and of bleakness and of despair. And as he got this kind of word, he began to wonder, what is it that I have done? His family rallied around him privately, as we now know from the Braden Hatchet collections. They were saying they hoped that if Tom ever writes another book, it won't be about Asheville. And instead of writing what he called, Oh Lost, the initial title of the Gormwood Angel. They wish he would write Old Found and get something that was more positive, not altogether negative. Nevertheless, publicly they rallied around him. His mother, that indomitable woman, one of the really great women of the South, she never cracked at all under the pressure. She said simply and grandly that whatever my son does is right and I hope that he makes a lot of money off of it, which was really rather wonderful. But Tom was much upset. He was mm, so troubled by this that he did not, in fact, come back to Asheville until 1937. Finally, in 1937, he managed to get his courage up, and he had been told that he would be welcome. Uh, he came home. Uh, he rented a little cabin out at Oteen in the hills up above Asheville where he was going to write that summer. And to his amazement, he found that things had changed that people had forgotten about much of the past, that there were people who were really rather pleased to be in a celebrated uh, American novel. He decided that it was all right uh, to have used uh, names, uh, people, but the next time he do it, he called anybody a son of a, he was not going to give his mailing address and his telephone number. He would be a little more reticent in the future. But Asheville welcomed him back. Wolf, in turn, was a very humble and wrote for the Asheville Citizen uh, a little passage called Return, which was published uh, in the newspaper, in which he said that he regretted any difficulties of the past. He regretted if he had offended anyone. He had not intended to do so, and that he was very fond indeed of his home city and of his home state, and that he hoped to spend much time there. Most of the reaction in the reviews was quite positive. It was not, though, one ought to say, a kind of instant bestseller. It was not spread across the front pages of the New York Times or the New York Herald Tribune. It was given respectful attention on inside uh, pages. It did become a bestseller very briefly in Great Britain when published there. Critical comments were generally quite favorable though often very puzzled. The most educated reviewers pointed out a connection with James Joyce, and as Richard Aldington said, this is the one book uh, that has been inspired by Mr. Joyce that is any good because Mr. Wolf has learned how to follow Mr. Joyce without imitating him. Most people did not know what to make of this book. Faulkner's major work had not yet appeared. The Sound and the Fury appeared that same year. Erskine Caldwell was unpublished. Richard Wright had not published. So Wolf showed a South that readers did not know how to deal with. They didn't know how to cope with. Consequently, they were puzzled by this enormous book. Many found it stimulating. Many found much that was good in it. Many threw up their hands and said, we don't know what to make of it. 
And that was one of the reasons why so many said, we don't know what to make of this man either. Maybe, like so many writers, he has one novel in him, an autobiographical novel, he's written it, but he has nothing else to say. It's the second novel that will be the test. And that is what drove Wolf into a frenzy, because it was not for six years that he had a second novel, and in that time, he worried in his own heart whether they might be right, whether he had said all that he had to say. Wolf would never have the opportunity to say all he hoped to say. His restless spirit roamed Europe and this country and it became a part of all that he touched. And furiously, he continued writing his vision of the world. He would write one more novel of Time in the River in 1935 before he died three years later. Thomas Wolfe stated that the single most important event that affected him in his life was the death of his brother Ben. In Look Homeward Angel, he remembers the light in the sick room that burned from the Victorian window, bringing to him its grim vision of struggle. Within the family, Eugene's older brother Ben was his favorite. Ben was the only one he could communicate with. In 1918, during the influenza epidemic, Ben, always a weak in body, died in this room, on this bed. You see, before Eugene could develop, there had to be, in the sense of Christian theology, a sacrificial intermediary. And so it was that Ben had to serve that awful purpose. But with Ben's death, the stone had been uplifted and the leaf turned over and the door at last had been entered. Ben, now a ghost, has made it possible for Eugene to begin his transformation into artist. And at this point in the novel, the angel is manifest and now can begin to look homeward. As a writer, Wolf searched endlessly for a language and a form to communicate his vision. He never gave up, and just before he died, he knew that if he were to find the stone, the leaf, the door, it would be within his work. 